Hello, welcome to Rethink Ready, a series of conversations about the post-pandemic workforce brought to you by Working Nation and LinkedIn. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how we can improve the inclusion and diversity in hiring. And then once people are brought into a company, how we can improve retention and career growth. Joining me today to talk about these important topics are Lorraine Harriton, President and CEO of Catalyst, Gary A. Officer, CEO of the Center for Workforce Inclusion, Thomas Sexton, Senior Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging for LinkedIn, and Nefertiri Sakut, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the City of Philadelphia. We're going to dive deeply into the subject, but first we want to talk about a personal story. I'm Angela and I live uh, recently now in San Diego, California. If I had to describe myself based on the things I do, I would say I'm a mom. And then after that, I would say that I'm a hard worker, determined, a jack of all trades, master of maybe a couple. I went straight from high school to working at Blue Cross. I got accepted to Biola University to go to nursing school. During nursing school, I got sick. So for two and a half years, I was out of commission. At the same time, I got married, had a baby. It kind of all happened right back to back. So school was put on hold. There was just trying to stay alive. Eventually, I got my bachelor's degree in communications because I knew it was something I could always use in any career I had. Being a mom gives you lots of skills. I mean, multitasking is a huge one. Time management, because there's always multiple things you have to get done and you have to find out which one is a priority over one. My daughter is a student who has different abilities and I saw how important it was for her to be homeschooled. I didn't know how to homeschool and work a full-time corporate job. There were many times where I had five jobs at a time where I would be teaching online to students in China and I was teaching at a learning center at the same time, three to five times a week. And on top of that, I was working at retail stores. I chose to work those specific jobs because they were very flexible. They were part-time. They allowed me to parent and work. We did that schedule really up until COVID. When all that stopped and I really couldn't pay rent for the first time, one of my best friends, she works in leasing consulting. She's been trying to get me for a long time to work this job. At my current job, I am a leasing consultant for a property management full-time. There's a lot of uh, good things there, but the first thing I obviously don't like is the, is the lack of flexibility. There's just none at all. You get an hour to figure out the kids' school and dinner and every other hour is working. At this time, I don't have anybody professionally that, that's... Um, helping me or supporting me. I don't really know where to go for that and I don't have the money. I don't even know where to begin to find a professional that I can afford. Typically when I am looking for another job, I'm just online. I Google all kinds of word searches and different phrases and I've tried that, I've tried LinkedIn. Everything is on the internet and you send your application out there, you send your resume out there and you have no idea if anybody ever sees it. Maybe my resume just isn't showing my skill enough there's like a lot of thoughts that can come in your mind when you're, you know you have black going against you and then you're a woman and then you're a single mom. It's like, so those are already three strikes. Well, I hope they overlook those things so they can just see that I'm actually a really good worker and I can actually help your business do better, you know? I have very little savings. I'm already halfway through life almost. So to think about being so behind is scary sometimes because you're like, man, how are you going to catch up? I don't want to quit anything anymore in my life. And I want to succeed and I want to have a career, but I just don't know like how to do that when I'm trying to raise teenagers now. Lorraine, Angela's story is really reflective of a lot of stories that we hear from women these days before and after the pandemic. And we'd like to talk about how could we help someone like her? She seems to have some skills. She has a work history, but she still is stuck in that place where childcare um, and her day-to-day -day work life is standing in the way of her career. That was a great story about a story that 
many women, especially women from um, of color in the United States um, are dealing with. But, you know, I actually think that there's a real opportunity coming out of this pandemic to really change um, things for the better. The pandemic has really laid bare the big inequities that we have in society. Um, the um, burden of unpaid labor that she's talking about as a single mother in particular, um, the, you know, the health issues that have impacted um, unequally different parts of society. But on the other hand, we're in a world where there's a war for talent going on right now. There's a much better understanding of these inequities and companies are really trying to lean into that. And flexibility, uh, hybrid and remote work are on the tips of, of everyone's tongue. And when we think about flexibility, and she talked about flexibility a lot, uh, we need to talk about um, when people work, where people work, and how they work. And we need to develop policies and practices that really support that. The video just touched me because um, my mother actually was working in a, uh, at the World Trade Center. I was born in 1976. And so um, she made a decision when my brother and I were born to uh, stop working and to uh, stay at home and to raise us. She was single, and so um, she didn't want to put us in child care. Um, and so she sacrificed her career um, mobility so that uh, she could be at home with my, with my brother and, and myself. But in doing that, she limited her own career mobility. And by the time I went to college and law school and so forth, uh, there was one, at one time where she was working at a, a, a fast food uh, restaurant, you know, and my mother was very smart, um, but she didn't have the same options to um, to work from home and to take care of us. And she didn't have that network and that support. And so, you know, the video just touched me because um, as we think about recovering from the pandemic, thinking about equity and thinking about fairness and um, and the ability to work remotely, not just be for the people who have the advanced degrees, and uh, uh, but to be, you know, more equitable for others. I just wanted to offer that because it, it really um, touched me and made me think about my my own mother. Given Angela's situation, what is the answer? What can she do? One thing I often recommend to people that are um, thinking about any kind of career crossroads, that could be re-entering the workforce, that could be making a career shift, is think about the power of an informal conversation. And that can take the form of finding somebody, it could be within your network, in her case, it doesn't sound like she has a network that can introduce her to her job directly. It could be using a platform like, like LinkedIn to find a friend of a friend who might be part of an industry that you want to become a part of. And just begin to have those informal conversations, understanding what skills does it take to get a new job? What are the people that you might want to connect with to learn more about what that work looks like? And by having more of those conversations, you can understand, one, what types of skills you may already have, and just you need to think about how you represent them in a way that will land with a potential employer. And two, you may open the door to somebody who's hiring or somebody who knows somebody who's hiring. And so beginning with those informal conversations, I think that can be a really powerful first step. I would add to that, you know, I a lot of people tend to try and find employment with an exact similar institutional profile. She's in San Diego. She may be in let go by Bank of America, but some of our nation's largest credit unions are in Southern California. And oftentimes bankers don't look at credit unions as a place for employment, when in fact all their skills are transferable. So my point is, look in places that you would not have ordinarily explored, but where your skills may transfer. And to my colleague's earlier point, find those networks, have those conversations, and, and try to map out places where you, where you wouldn't ordinarily look, but where opportunities may exist. Gary, um, I wanted to ask you, one of the things Angela said is, she identified, she self-identified herself. She's black. She's single, she's a woman. So does that, get, does that get screened in the hiring process? 
she is con be confronted by issues around gender, issues around race, issues around healthcare, issues around flexibility of, of, of time to get to work and to take care of her children. And then she has to go through algorithms that picks out and decodes her worthiness because now we have delegated HR to a click and a mouse. So the human story that is reflected in this young lady's life is one that can be told over and over again. And we have to change how we think about our society, how we think about our employees, and how we create real opportunities to allow them to find a meaningful place back into the workforce. And the debate in the workforce space is about technology, hybrid, virtual, you name it. That doesn't apply to retail workers. It doesn't apply to restaurant workers. So a monolithic band-aid approach to this issue may not be the solution. Adapting strategy to meet the needs of different segments of the workforce may just be the way to go. Let's take it from the business point of view, though. Where does a company start? Thomas, where do they start this work that so needs to be done? That's a, a great question. And, and um, I talk to a lot of my peers or other HR leaders that are thinking about um, that very question. Uh, and it's not always posed, I'm starting from scratch. How do I get this off the ground? It's often there's energy within my organization around diversity, inclusion, and belonging, but it's, it doesn't feel like a strategy. We don't feel like we've actually gotten past that sort of grassroots energy phase. Um, and, and a couple of things that I think are really important for organizations to think about is, uh, one is, why is this important to your organization specifically? Why is diversity, inclusion, and belonging important for your organization specifically? And there's various reasons why that might be. There, there's a lot of discussion, uh, I think rightly, about the business case for a diverse and inclusive workforce. We, we understand, and I, I think it's fairly conclusive, the research, that more diverse organizations outperform less diverse organizations. Uh, but I actually think it's important for organizations to go past that business case and really tie it directly to their own or organization directly. Um, and that might be um, might take the form of better able being better able to meet the needs of your customer base. Uh, it might take the form of being able to innovate more quickly. But by tying the kind of objective of diversity and inclusion to what you're trying to accomplish already as an organization, that gives that work much more staying power. Um, so at LinkedIn, uh, where, where I work, our why really centers around our vision as an organization. And our vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And that is a notion that every single person at LinkedIn is familiar with. We talk about that vision quite a bit within the organization. And so when we say we will not be successful in achieving our vision as a company of creating economic opportunity, if we don't understand what the barriers are to economic opportunity, and if our own workforce doesn't reflect the member base or, or the workforce that we're trying to serve, we will not be successful in achieving that vision. That brings this idea of diversity and inclusion from a project that somebody is interested in to something that's actually core for the organization's success. So that, that's the first thing I would always start with is, is the why. The second is I would treat diversity, inclusion, and belonging as you would any other business priority. And so that means doing a diagnostic, understanding what are your biggest areas of opportunity. It means developing a strategy. Um, and developing a strategy often means prioritizing a few things that are gonna be most important in driving results. I think there's often a temptation to try to do everything you can possibly think of. So prioritizing your strategy and then ultimately putting measurement behind that. So how do you know, just like any other business priority that you would be measuring against, how do you know whether or not you're successful against that strategy? And Nefertiri, as the Chief Diversity Officer of Philadelphia, you're taking this big picture that Thomas is talking about and you're really applying it to a group of people, the residents of your city. What have you guys been doing in Philadelphia to improve this uh, process? In the city of Philadelphia, um, one of the things that I would uh, note is just really taking a focus on workforce equity. And so um, in local government, basically workforce equity means that your workforce reflects the um, representation or the composition of the city in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, and, and so forth. And so in thinking about equity, um, it's a little bit different from diversity and inclusion. So when you have diversity, you're really thinking about the composition of your workforce. And when you're thinking about inclusion, you're thinking about culture, 
right, in behavior and belonging. And when you think about equity, you're really looking at um, policies and procedures and programs and how uh, the processes around your policies and your programs um, may be inconsistent and may be in some cases unfair and have a, a, a disproportionate impact on your employees. And in some cases, um, unintentionally maintain existing disparities. And so that's, um, I just offer that because diversity, equity, and inclusion is really important in terms of recovery from the, the pandemic. Um, and sometimes as an organization, we do, we, we invest in a lot of programs or different types of resources to improve outcomes, but we're not taking an internal look at our organization and the, the policies and processes and procedures of our organization and how we can improve those to also have a more um, you know, equitable uh, organization. I would love you to give us an example because we had talked about this previously about how you change some of the screening and testing process to make sure that when they apply that they have uh, an equal opportunity to get a job. One of the things that we did was really look at data to understand the composition of our workforce um, by race, ethnicity, gender, and so forth, and to see where there are gaps um, between uh, the workforce and the community that we serve. And there were a good number of positions where uh, we see an underrepresentation of diverse talents. And we want to understand, um, you know, why is there an underrepresentation? And so one of the things that we did was just, you know, look at a few positions and map out the hiring pathway from application to hire to see where applicants are falling out of the hiring pathway. And so there was one particular position at the Department of Parks and Recreation for um, a recreation leader uh, position. And we saw that there were, uh, were a good number of applicants who were dropping out of the hiring pathway because of the civil service exam or the examination that they have to take um, to be hired. It was a written exam. And, and thinking about equity, what we realized is that Number one, um, exams don't necessarily uh, depict who's the best qualified candidate for a job. You could just be a great test taker. You could be a poor test taker. And so it's not really reflective of um, entirely of whether or not you're the best uh, uh, person for the job. And so the commissioner of that department um, changed the written exam to an oral exam. And when she changed the written exam to an oral exam, the top test takers uh, on that particular exam really increased in terms of race and ethnicity and gender. Whereas uh, people of color, women made up 10 to 12% of the top test takers on the written exam, they increased to 60% of the top test takers on the oral exam. And so what that was able to do was keep the rigor of the examination process to identify the best candidate, um, but also change a, a policy in terms of testing that was more equitable, that helped to identify candidates who were really best positioned for the job and have more diversity in the applicant pool. You still have to be interviewed for the position once you pass the exam, but it really widened um, the diversity of the applicant pool, which was necessary to um, get more diversity up the chain. Gary, I wanna ask you a question and then open it up for comments from the rest of you. It's interesting in the conversation so far, older workers are not mentioned very often. There's a population out there, 40 plus, 50 plus, people were working until they're 75, but sometimes they're overlooked in this process, the hiring process, because of their age. And I know Gary at the Center for Workforce Inclusion, you guys do a lot of work there about this. So talk to me a little bit about where we're at and where we can go from here. So we are one of the largest partners of the Department of Labor on a program called CSEP, which is the Senior Community Service and Employment Program. That program serves less than half of 1% of the total eligible pool of Americans, low and moderate income, who are seeking to return to the workforce but need some help. And why is this important? Because even at the best of times, let's go back to last year, we created between October of last year and March of this year, 2.8 million new jobs. 
those jobs were created for and filled by primarily Americans who were 45 and younger. In that very same time span, only 28,000 jobs were created and filled by Americans who were 55 and over. So a massive disconnect between need and opportunity. By the year 2025, older Americans will represent the largest single segment of the US workforce. I think Lorraine, I think I studied that. I'm sure Nefertari is aware of that. I'm sure my colleagues at LinkedIn is aware of that. 25% of the US workforce will be 50 and over. What are we doing to ensure that they will enjoy the opportunity to engage, survive, and thrive in a dependent economy, an age-dependent economy? That's a big issue we have to confront. And then we're gonna confront the issues around bias and culture. We are a society that makes our hiring decisions when we do not rely on algorithms. We rely on, we make decisions informed by certain judgments and bias. And when I've been in organizations that had much younger employees and managers, and I saw who they were hiring, I kept asking myself, could they have found somebody, someone with a different set of skills, a different racial profile, that would have filled those exact jobs? Then I have what's called the water cooler observation. We hire people based on our desire and our inclination to engage with them on a social basis. It's the water cooler, it's the Friday night happy hour. When we change our mindset, that workforce inclusion and equity begins with how we judge people for the qualities they bring into the workforce, more so than our ability to engage them as friends, then we are making strides. So it's a long-winded response to say it's multi-layered, multi-faceted. It, the, the issue disproportionately affects older minority women and minorities at the best of times, and it will get worse unless we fix it. Flexibility is critical for older people as well. Part-time jobs that give them the opportunity to um, enjoy their older years and yet have more uh, you know, yet have work that really is meaningful. And, you know, as an older person myself, I will tell you that as people move on, they want more flexibility. They, in fact, flexibility is important at lots of different stages in life. Secondly, um, companies are having a lot of success with returnership programs. This is especially important for, you know, women who have to uh, drop out um, uh, of the workforce because of childcare responsibilities, but also, you know, elder care responsibilities. Um, so um, a lot of companies are really leaning into returnership programs. And the last thing um, that's part of returnership is upskilling. Um, we all need to be lifelong learners and companies are now really investing in upskilling and reskilling. Um, and as we um, look to have labor shortages, we are going to have to lean into a broader set of employees in the workplace. And companies who get ahead of this and really invest in this are gonna have a broader pool of real talent um, that they can, um, they can tap into. Lorraine made a great point about apprenticeships. Only 3.3% of all apprenticeship programs are made available and, up and provided to Americans who are 55 and over. 3.3% of apprenticeship programs are available to and are customized for older Americans. I mean, that's a shocking statistic, right? And I think as we think about diversity and inclusion, we've got to make sure that we um, advocate for an, a, a resource model that captures the needs of not just every community, every gender, every racial profile, but folks across the age spectrum. Because that to me will represent the last frontier for this country, how we treat our older workers and the opportunities that we provide for them. You know, I'd like to take that point and talk about providing for those workers. I know, Thomas, one of the things that you're very passionate about is what do we do once we get people in the door? We, we broaden our workforce. We are more inclusive. We're more diverse. But 
we don't want to bottleneck at entry level jobs. How do we retain? How do we grow a career? I think there's a couple of things that are really important for organizations to think about as part of a diversity and inclusion strategy across a number of different dimensions. One is how are you thinking about career growth and development? So one of the biggest reasons why people leave a professional environment for another job is they feel like they can advance faster by leaving than they can by staying. Uh, and so it's especially important when you're thinking about groups that are underrepresented within your company about are you creating equitable access to development opportunities and career growth. And that might mean asking yourself, who is getting the benefit of sponsorship within this organization and who disproportionately might not be? Who is engaging in mentorship within the organization? How are we conveying and communicating what it means to advance at the company? Is that codified? Is that clear? Or is that sort of written in a set of unwritten rules that, that some people may have access to and others may not? Um, so growth and development, I think, is incredibly important if you're going to sustain the benefits of diversity um, over time. Another piece that, that was touched on a bit is what type of environment are you creating within your organization? And, and so we refer to that often as the environment of belonging. Um, and one thing that I would love to call out that a couple of other folks on the panel have mentioned as well is people managers. People managers, line managers in particular, are so incredibly important in creating that environment of belonging or not creating it. Um, and that is a huge opportunity and also a huge challenge, uh, at least in my experience in diversity, inclusion, and belonging, because organizations have hundreds, dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of line managers, and people are coming from a very different point in their diversity and inclusion journey. Some are, are very naturally inclusive leaders. Others don't even understand what does it even mean to be an inclusive leader. So thinking about how are you educating your manager population is so incredibly important, beginning with just clarifying for them what does it mean to be an inclusive leader within your organization, and then giving them the tools to help develop those skills. And when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it's not a bottom-up phenomena. It starts at the top. It starts in the boardroom. It starts in the C-suite. And leadership sets the example. Leadership informs culture. And leadership implements tactics that generate outcomes. And until we are fundamentally honest with ourselves about where and how we can solve this issue, then we're gonna wait for another 15, 20 more years for another George Floyd, another COVID-19, to have this very same conversation all over again. I'm a, an avid LinkedIn user. I can't tell you how many friends of mine in the last 12 months, or people I may know, who've been announced as new chief diversity officers. But does it solve the issue? Does it change C-suite practices? When I'm approached by a money manager asking to manage my pension fund, and I go to the, to the website, and not a person of color is on their website or in their boardroom, what, is it, what does it tell me about this country? So we have to be intellectually honest. We have to be bold in speaking truth to workforce justice and call it for what it is. We have a very long way to go, and we have to own this together. Nefertiri, how do you feel about that? Do you think we are making an impact? Gary makes some very good points. The diversity, equity, and inclusion work, it's hard. It, it, it is um, hard. It's, it can be tiresome. It, it can be exhausting. Um, and I would say that because you're seeking to disrupt the status quo. How do you refashion something? How do you uh, uh, take something apart and put it back together? Um, to make it more equitable. That's, that's more work. It's additional work. It's, it's the right work, um, but it takes an extra level of intentionality. It takes an extra level of commitment, and it takes an extra level of effort. And so it's not easy, um, and it can be tiresome. And that's why it's very, very necessary that it's a shared commitment. The commitment does fr come from the top. It cannot be, and what I would add to that is it, it also cannot be a siloed commitment. The commitment cannot live to the chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer or to a specific unit. It, it has to be a shared commitment in order for it to be successful in the organization. Um, in the city of Philadelphia, one of the things I really do is I really, really uh, uh, lean on the Office of Human Resources. 
um, as a partner in this work. I lean on the Department of Labor. I lean on employee relations. I lean on the law department. I lean on the mayor's office of communications. There are so many people who are um, um, integral and necessary for this work to be uh, successful. So there, there, there has to be a shared commitment because um, it's a heavy load to carry and you, and you can't carry it alone. And so one of the things that we have to do is get better at connecting the dots, um, get better at being intellectually honest, and get better at being intentional um, around this work. Lorraine or Thomas, would you like to add anything to that? I'll add one thing. Um, agree completely with what, what Gary and Nefertiri shared. And, and I think part of what's necessary to sustain momentum, so, so Gary talked about George Floyd's murder a year ago. Um, and I think in many ways, the, the kind of renewed movement for racial justice that followed shifted things. Um, but there's an open question of, was that a temporary shift or a permanent shift? Um, and I think within at least corporate organizations, and I think this is really true potentially across any organization, whether that shift is sustained deter is determined in part around which accountability mechanisms are put in place over time. Uh, and so are the leadership team or the senior leaders within an organization tracking progress against diversity, inclusion, and belonging goals in the same way that they track progress against monetization goals or customer goals or advertising and marketing goals? Um, I, I think when you start to see those accountability mechanisms put in place, and that's something that we've done, I think, in a more rigorous way over the past 12 months than we ever have before, we look at how are we progressing against our goals and how is each individual leader within the organization progressing against their goals on a quarterly basis rather than on an annual basis or rather than when a big um, external event occurs in the news and we check in on how we're doing. But setting those ongoing accountability mechanisms is critical. I'd like to add that you know, we have, we're at a very unique period of time because the focus on racial justice coupled with the rapid um, technological innovation that's happening right now gives us a unique opportunity. I, I think it's actually, you know, there hasn't been an opportunity like this since the Industrial Revolution to really make major change. But it takes a lot of intentionality. Now, the exciting thing is I deal with a lot of corporations, a lot of CEOs. There is real intentionality, and it seems to be sustainable. So, um, so we need to seize this moment. And so there's really four areas, and we've been talking about it throughout this um, conversation, that companies can really focus on. First of all, it's commitment and intentionality at the top. Secondly, it's measurement and accountability that we just talked about at length. Thirdly, it's putting the policies and um, practices in place that will help us to have structures that can, um, can be implemented. And fourthly, it's about changing culture and building a more inclusive um, culture. All of these things need to be focused on in order to really make sustainable change. So, you know, I'm optimistic. I think we have a really unique opportunity. I'm hoping that the people here will help really create the future we really want uh, to make happen. I'd like to thank everyone for this stimulating and important conversation. Gary, Nefertiri, Thomas, Lorraine, thank you so much. This conversation was made possible by the generous funding of Lumina Foundation.